glad to have Dr. Beckers with us here today to talk about um, direct use system design. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Katie. You, you forgot to mention about 10 years ago, I participated myself in the competition. So it's great to see now that, that it's still going on and, um, and that I'm able to you know, help you now with, um, with, with my presentation. Oh yeah, let's try to share my screen here. Um, we just tested that. Screen two, and I go in the screen. All right. Um, so, so good morning, or, or I guess good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, so, in in this presentation, I want to just share with you some of the, you know, lessons, rules of thumbs. Um, that I've learned over the years uh, when I was researching or designing geothermal uh, direct use uh, systems. So I wanna make sure we have an hour available, but I wanna make sure there's enough time at the end for, for questions. So if you have any question, you know, just put it in the chat box. Uh, maybe I'll, I can address it like on the fly. Otherwise we'll just, um, you know, go through all those questions uh, at the end. But this is a quick outline here of my presentation. So I wanna just you know, start briefly with um, just a quick introduction, you know, what, what is geothermal direct use? What is it all you know, entails? And then I wanna give you some references that I have found useful over the years um, that can help you with, you know, with your project when you design a direct use system. And then I wanna go a little more into you know, how you may characterize your resource that you're considering and then because most importantly is that number four there, we'll spend a lot of time there on you know, how you may design your direct use application. What are different things you have to keep in mind? What are some, I guess, some, some rules of thumb you have to follow? Um, and then, you know, finally, I also want to talk a little bit about a techno economics. You may actually do that in your project yourself, or you're not just looking at, let's say, megawatts of temperatures, but also at something like how much will it cost? and and what is, let's say, a levelized cost of heat or so. So I wanna make sure we cover you know, all those you know, topics. Just like a, a quick overview here. This is a, a, um, like a, a diagram that I took from the GeoVision report. So when we are you know, talking about direct use, of course, we're talking about you know, using the, the geothermal resource for um, an application that is not electricity generation. So we wanna use the heat directly for any application that can use the heat. And there's different classifications there. Um, I will not really talk in my presentation about the very shallow heat pump systems. And you know people consider that direct use as well. So I guess that's a little bit shown here on the left. I'll be talking more about the, the deeper systems, not necessarily you know, the very deep direct use where you have to drill several kilometers, including some shallower wells that maybe are you know, a few kilometers or, or tens of thousands of feet or so. Um, consider, consider those as well, but when we wanna see what can we do with that heat? How would we use that heat? How can we design um, a system like that? And there are, of course, several applications possible. And we go you know, provide many examples there um, in one of the next slides. So I guess some, some initial things that are distinguished from electricity is it's very easy to transport electricity and on the grid, but it's not very easy to transport hot water or, or, or steam over long distances. So that immediately forces you to kind of look locally. You have to see what is my local application and what's my local uh, resource. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. And I'll give some numbers there, cost numbers and, and heat losses that's um, late, later in the presentation. I'll convince you that it's definitely a co-location problem. Um, that we're talking here about. The other thing that you, you know it's important to direct use that I'm sure you'll do in your uh, in your application. You need to be sure that you know the temperatures match the application that you have. You need to make sure the megawatts, the kind of size of system can match um, what your application requires. So we'll definitely spend you know, a lot of time there um, on those kind of topics. If there is some kind of a mismatch, it's not the end of the world. You can do things like hybridize your system. And that's very popular nowadays where let's say, for example, you have a, a large heat pump system that can boost the temperature or if you have storage tanks and those kinds of things. So we'll talk about those as well. Uh, that may be important in your design. It definitely can, or typically can actually lower a little bit your overall levelized cost. So it's definitely valuable to look into that. And then, you know, finally, I'll 
you know, talk for sure about techno-economics, all these things come into play with the subsurface, the surface, things like discount rates, et cetera. So we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. So here are some, some references. I actually have two slides here on references that I've used over the years that I think maybe you're already using in, in, in your project. Um, I just wanted to make sure you're aware of those. I provided some links on those. Um, I think this, this presentation, I mean, it is for core, but it also will be shared with you. And so you can just you know, click on the link and then you have the report. So this first one, I think it's a very, like a, a major you know, landmark report. It's already you know, several years old. I think it's from the nineties, but it's, it came out of the Geo Heat Center, which was at um, Oregon Institute of, of Technology. They were really specialized um, on direct use you know, analysis and they put out these reports and newsletters. And this was one of them, which has multiple chapters, and it really goes through all the details of um, of direct use. And you know, some of the things are a little bit outdated because it's already you know 30 years old. You know, the cost numbers, of course, they have to be updated, etc. But some of the things that are mentioned there, but most of the things like rules of thumbs and so they are still you know valid. And um, I actually have I use some of the, the the figures in my presentation from that report. Um, then more recently, there is a report from Enel that came out that. It's part of the GeoVision study that focuses on district heating in the United States. It goes into a lot of detail on how you may, you know, design it and, and come up with um, a levelized cost of heat. It talks about that as well. It has lots of references that it uses. So I think that's a very valuable report to take a look at. Here are some other ones, um, um, studies that, you know, more deep, um, localized studies or like this one was specifically for New York State and, and Pennsylvania I mean, it was a, a colleague of mine who looked into you know, designing district heating systems in, in, in those area and in those areas. And he um he really documented all his methods. So I think this is a very valuable you know, resource uh, or reference to have as well. This was this last one here, it, it's a more recent publication that actually I was part of where um, we use geofires. Uh, this, you know, we talked about that tool a few weeks ago. Uh, but we use that um, tool to do a techno-economic analysis of you know, deep direct use in the United States. And so all those files are uploaded on GitHub. And I think some of, of you, if you may find it useful you know, in, in the analysis of your uh, project. And finally, these are three papers here that also come out of the, the Geo Heat Center um, that were authored by, by John Lund. He was really like the PI there. Um, these are um, uh, references that you know that document you know statistics on direct use, uh, but also actually what we're gonna really talk about today, like how you design a direct use system. For example, this one on the right here, I think these are is a very valuable uh, reference to take a look at um, as part of your project. So now I want to go a little bit more into uh, the subsurface, some of the you know the aspects that you have to take in mind when you are evaluating. Um, that's for your project. So uh, in a sense, what you, like the most important, like the two most important things in a sense that you need to know is what kind of flow rate are you getting and what kind of temperature are you getting? Because you know, temperature, first of all, that kind of needs to you know, match your application. If let's say you only expect to get 70 degrees Celsius, for, but your application is you know, heating at a chemical plant for a high temperature application, which maybe requires over 100 degrees C, that there's definitely a mismatch there. It's going to be, you know, a little more more challenging. So, you know, kind of keep your temperatures in mind. You know, with direct use, that is in a sense very very important. And then, you know, the second thing, the floor comes into play because that then determines the the, the size of your system, uh, the megawatts that you're getting. And there's a lot of parameters that go into you know determining what your resource, you know, what it can um, supply to your application. And, the, you know, this webinar is not intended to go into, you know, into too much detail about, about those. I want to focus more on the surface design and surface application, but I did want to just talk a little bit about it, that when you are characterizing your surface and when you're looking for a formation that you may use to produce heat or an aquifer or maybe even basement rock with an EGS type, Reservoir. These are all different things that you have to you know, keep in mind. You know, what are the depths there that plays into plays a big role into your drilling cost? You know, the volume indirectly determines the kind of size that you can get. Your permeabilities will determine the kind of flow rates that you can get. 
Um, but you know, you, you can go down that list and start going into properties that you may need to know for your reservoir, like the thermal conductivity, heat capacity, all those things in a sense go into a reservoir simulator that can determine your, your temperatures over time. Um, even things like faults can become important of how your 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 flow of, you know, field is there, or maybe even you need to worry about um, induced seismicity or so. You know, you can even go into more detail and like start looking into chemistry of things that may determine if you if you have scaling issues, it may govern things like how, how cold you, you can draw down at, at the reservoir before you may run into issues you know, with precipitation and such. Uh, I don't think in this project you're going to start looking into geomechanics, but then the stress field comes into play. So there's a lot already there, you know, that in a sense all plays into your subsurface characterization. And there's actually even more things like what your local laws are in terms of your permit and maybe um, some rules there that you have to stay within. So uh, the lease that you may get you know, for the size, the, the acreage that you may be able to get. So when you look into the, 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 the resource, you know, you can try to keep these things in mind. Um, I think the main thing you want to, want to do is what are my temperatures or what are my megawatts that I can get but if you have information on some of these others you know perfect probably you want to include it in your in your report and maybe comment on it um, but I just don't want to go into too much more detail here but just to keep in mind that there's a lot that goes into play in a sense and into you know investigating you know, the subsurface system and I kind of just put it one slide here on how your approach may be when you um, Try to get all the information that 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 you you know try to get for for your for your local you know, resource, and you probably in this project you probably will just focus on on these desktop studies on you know the first few, but in an entire project you know you typically will run through all of those um, when an actual direct use system you know, gets you know developed gets deployed. So. Uh, I, I believe you know most of you are already aware of the geothermal prospector tool. I don't know. I think that's a very good resource to start. There's a lot of information there, uh, not not just on on the subsurface, actually also on the surface. But there's has a lot of subsurface information in terms of bottom hole temperatures, in terms of this resource maps uh, available there. I actually took a little screenshot here, um, and then you can kind of zoom in into. You know the location that you're at, and you can see other nearby wells that can provide me with some some information. Are there, let's say, um, has a study been done on the temperature and depth? So there may be different slices. You can get a sense of how deep you need to go to get a certain uh, to reach a certain temperature. There's there's also a you know, rock, you know, reservoir data in there in terms of you know, permeabilities and so. So there's a lot of information you can also already get from just looking at some of those studies that have been done in these tools that are out there. You know, typically, um, uh, well, at least in some regions, you may benefit a lot from existing wells that have been drilled in oil and gas, or even water wells, where you know, a lot of that information is available you know, publicly. Um, sometimes you know, may have to contact you know, the state geology department or so, but there's a lot of information you can find online. There's you know, well surveys, logging that has been done, like a lot of information that's out there that can, can, can guide you into you know, understanding what your subsurface looks like and kind of like it addresses many of these parameters that are listed there. You know, typically what would happen next is, and that's a little bit, you know, I'm thinking about at Cornell, we are in, in a project developing a district heating system and we're kind of went through all these phases and recently we completed several of those where there's a lot of geologic studies that you may do, like looking at outcrops, try to get some cores or so. Um, also looking at um, you can you know, do a seismic survey. There's data like gravity data, hydromagnetic data. So this becomes a little bit more, let's say, you know, costly and, and, and time consuming, but typically you know, these are kind of like the next phase in characterizing your, your subsurface. And I don't think you know, you'll be doing that as part of this project. Although there is some publicly available information out there on some of these geophysical tools that may you know, help you in, in better understanding you know, your, your, your subsurface. Um, and then finally, and it's kind of like where we're in this phase now at the Cornell District Heating Project, where we're about to, to drill a well. So typically that is like the next phase. Once you've done everything you could without really drilling a well, kind of like the next thing is really you got to just go, you know, go down there and actually penetrate the reservoir, drill an exploration well to, 
in your at your site to really see what does the subsurface look like. There's all kinds of logging you can do then. There's all kinds of well tests that you can do. Um, and that, that really will, in a sense, ground through to, um, like lower the risk in your project. And then you really understand what, what how your subsurface looks like. And typically one well may not be enough. And they often would drill multiple wells. They sometimes will do temperature gradient wells. You know, some wells become observation wells. So there can be a whole campaign that people do um, to, to uh, characterize your subsurface field and understand it. And so I just want to briefly like, give you some information there on how that's that may look, and maybe some of these bottom, uh, these top um, bullet points you may actually be able to do uh, in your project. So now I want to, you know, shift gears and go to uh, to the surface in a sense, to the different applications and to different things, you know, that are at play there. So I think, you know, as part of this project, you know, some of you may be looking at, you know, district heating. That's kind of like, a big, you know, this picture on the left here that shows actually a heat exchanger there. And then different piping, and, you know, as part of a heating, you know, buildings. But some of you may also consider other applications, and there are you know, several applications out there. Um, this, I think, was a very successful project in France, where uh, this is you know dozens of megawatt heat um, that was you know, developed in an EGS type reservoir in Richardshope, and, and this heat you know, is supplied to a chemical uh, refinery, like a chemical plant. So I think this was a very exciting project. Um, but um, even though know, there's even more simple applications like snow melting, and this is an example, I think it is in, 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 in Oregon, a climate fall, this picture is from. So actually all these pictures I took from the Enrol website. Um, there's some, like here it is, I think is an interesting one, is food processing. This is, I think, dehydration of food. But I'm sure everybody is uh, aware of you know, the hot spring type applications, you know, very common in Colorado. Um, but then also, you know, things like fish farming, greenhouses. So there's, you know, different applications out there that, that can use, you know, which you get, can use low temperature heat. And it says all these applications have a certain temperature requirement. And these are diagrams here that have been developed. I think they often refer to it as a Lindahl diagram. This was one of the first ones in Iceland. He, he developed this kind of chart in a paper. And but then the different versions have been made of, of this diagram. It just shows these applications, what temperature do they need? Um, and so you can see that like, there's some like fish farming, it needs very low temperature, but then you can go really high up. There's some chemical processes that need much higher temperatures. And so you kind of see, depending on the application that you're looking, you see what kind of temperatures uh, that you need. This is just in a sense, the same diagram, but just, I guess, in color. And there may be some different applications uh, on here. Um, usually they are, you know, very matching, but sometimes, you know, one diagram may be 10 degrees higher or 10 degrees lower. So, but generally they all, you know, kind of agree uh, with one another. So this is something I guess to keep in mind, you know, depending on, you know, the, the application that you're looking at, at in your project. Um, then this, this slide just kind of shows, you know, a, gen a generic um, design, like what, how you would typically start with a geothermal direct use system. So, you know, in I guess in most cases in your project, you probably will have a production and an injection well. I mean, in some cases, there, there have been cases where you don't have an injection well, but that's quite uncommon nowadays. It's mostly if you, you re-inject it, typically it's for the environmental reasons, but also for to maintain your, your reservoir pressure. But there have been examples, I don't know, in Iceland where they just discharge the production water in the ocean. So the you don't need the injection well, but you know, probably in your project, you'll have at least one production well, at least one injection well. Um, then, you know, this is kind of like a main thing for direct use system. Typically, the geothermal fluid that you produce, you may not be able to use it directly in your application. Uh, and that is typically because of, you know, fluid chemistry issues. Um, this is, you know, generally it's not really clean water that's being produced. In some cases, it's very nice and you don't need to worry about any chemistry issues that can come up. But in most cases, um, this, um, there is all kinds of minerals in there that can dissolve, that can cause scaling. Um, in some cases, even, you know, bad odor can be an issue with hydrogen sulfide. And so generally what you do is when you produce the geothermal fluid to the surface, you want to get it through a heat exchanger and as fast as possible re-inject it and get rid of it. And so in a sense, in this heat exchanger, you transfer the heat 
to a secondary fluid, you know, this could be then typically clean water, pure water, or it could be air or so. Uh, but then with, and then from there, you kind of use that into the rest of your uh, application. And so I'll, um, so I guess in most of your, in most of your designs, you probably will be looking at some kind of design like this, where you have at least some kind of heat exchanger at the surface that you need to account for the cost for that. You need to account for maybe some some thermal losses or so in there. And so I have some slides um, on that. And then, you know, with that heat, once that's transferred, it can go then to your application. And um, just before I go talk a little more about that, you know, there are different types of heat exchangers. I think, you know, most common is this plate and frame heat exchanger, which is actually shown here uh, on the last. They tend to be a little bit more, you know, compact and cheaper, you know, than, for example, the shell and tube heat exchangers. So you probably will be looking at one like that. Um, Anyway, so this looks like very simple, but it's not always that simple. There's lots of designs out there where it can get quickly very complicated, where you may, you know, have like things like storage tanks, you may have you know, multiple wells, you know, it kind of distributes in different you know, areas. In this particular, it's a district heating system here. You may have peaking boilers in there. So, you know, I would, I guess we don't want to. <laughs> Go into too much detail in this webinar, but these are some things I guess to keep in mind that some other components will come into play, and I'll talk a little bit about those um, later in the in the in the webinar. Um, you know, once um, you kind of you know have, are done with all your subsurfaces and so, and you start looking in your surface, I, one other important thing to 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 know is that um, you, you need to get a sense of what um, how my heat is required over time. Uh, at my application. And this is an example here for a university, for the Cornell University campus um, in Ithaca, New York. And so it starts, it follows the, their fiscal year. So it's that starts in July 1st. So you see during the summer months, this is in, in megawatt thermal, we, the campus, it's about 30,000 people or so, uh, needs about 10 megawatt or so baseload heating. This is for example, for hot water. Um, and then, but you can see once we go into the colder winter months, the heat demand really goes up and you have this peaking, you know, over 80 megawatt even, and then it starts you know, going down again. And so this kind of profile, uh, it, it, if you have, you know, kind of a district heating type application, it becomes important because you need to know when you develop your geothermal wells, you know, how well can you use them? Can you use them to the fullest extent or are there, you know, times where you have to shut down some wells because you don't need that map that much heat. So these are some things to keep in mind when you start sizing um, a system, you know, when you try to match um, the, the demand that's actually being needed. And so we'll talk more about it later, but um, it is, I guess, one thing to note is that ideally you have an application that requires the constant amount of heat year round because those are the easiest to size or to design, to design for, because you just have, you, you pick the lowest number of wells that you need and you can have them running uh, constant and then you, you get your heat. In this kind of situation, you don't want to size your system, your geothermal system, so it can provide 80 megawatt of heat because it will only be running that for a few hours of the year when that peak heating demand is in play. And most of the year, most of the wells <laughs> will be sitting idle. and so. That's something to keep in mind and that's where hybridization comes into play and so we'll talk more about that later but that's you know if you you may have to do something like this for application or at least try to estimate it based on your local climate or so you know and finally i just want to give you with this one equation that when you you know have no temperatures you know for it you can get the, the the heat demand so this may be you may have to do you know some kind of like calculations like this to can to get these kind of profiles or to when you have certain well, daytime temperatures, you can extract um, the heat demand from there, or when you know what heat demand you need and you know your temperatures, you can estimate the floor that you need, and that may determine then how many wells you need. So this kind of you know energy balance, maybe you may have to do you know as part of your project. Something else to keep in mind when you are designing your system is that when you have heat exchangers, you typically have you introduce some temperature drops that are you know, at play there because you know heat exchanger it needs some kind of finite temperature difference for the heat to transfer from the high to the low temperature, um, and so this is just an example that comes out, out of uh, one of the, the papers by Lund, um, which shows it provides some rules of thumb. It, it, it shows here 
this kind of heat exchange is from air to air. Uh, then you have here from water to air, and then here from water to water. And you can see, let's say if you want space heating, uh, just heating a building or so, and you want that building to be at 20 degrees Celsius, and you know, the rule of thumb could be that um, you will probably, you need some kind of supply temperature air, that the hot, your heated air needs to be higher than 20. And uh, the paper suggests, you know, it's about 15 degrees C above it. So that puts you at 35 degrees C. And then when you have some heat exchanger in there, and this is a water to air heat exchanger that, that typically needs an extra 10 degrees C um, to get to that 35. So that puts you at 45. And then a water to water, they tend to have the lowest temperature difference. So in order to heat up water to 45 C, then you need to have your hot water going up or starting at 50 C. So you kind of see if you want 20 C there, you, you, you need actually 50 degrees C over here. So there's something to keep in mind uh, when you are you know, designing your system, you know, when you have heat exchangers at play. And typically you can try to lower that temperature differential, but then that results in a larger heat exchanger, larger area, and those are more costly. So um, that's just something it's, I guess, like a little bit of a trade-off, a little bit of a balance that you may have to do there. This just shows some examples. You know, this would typically be then, um, I'd say, a, a, a water to water, like a plate and frame heat exchanger. Um, and I have some correlations that I'll show you about you know, how you may cost those out in your uh, project. This is an example of like a water to air heat exchanger um, that you may be considering uh, in your application. I just want to you know, give you a little bit of information on how you may you know, size your system. I think that's probably something you may want to do in your project if you. Um, have some kind of direct use application or have some kind of heat exchanger, you know, from, from a chilled thermal fluid to, you know, a pure water. Um, what kind of size do you need? Uh, what will that cost? So these are some, I guess, simple equations that you can use that are typically being used. It's kind of just shown here, typical sizing equation for a heat exchanger where it just gives the relationship in a sense between, you know, what your you know, heat supply is and what then your uh, the A is your area that you need. That's typically the one you're looking for. And then you have some kind of heat transfer coefficient that you can look in tables. But if you know water to water, you know these are, there are rules of thumb there on what it could be your typical values that you could pick for your project. Um, if you have, let's say, water to air, it tends to be lower. Um, I think higher up here, there may be some, you know, going to a gas here, there's already from a fluid to a gas, you see what kind of like an order of magnitude lower. Um, for the heat transfer coefficient there. And then finally, this delta T, that is like a, uh, actually a log mean temperature difference, but that's kind of like it's you know, related to this temperature difference that you have. And so that could typically be five to 10 degrees C or so. It says, but this kind of equation, you can get your area. And once you know the area, that is pretty much you know, the parameter that determines the cost for your heat exchanger and that goes into your economics when you do the technical economics of your project. I um, mean, there are lots of references out there when you're trying to you know, cost out your application. And so I just want to give you a reference here. I think this is a very valuable by Peters. Um, they have it's like a whole handbook with lots of, um, it goes into chemical plant design and sense, but have lots of equations for a different component, different equipment that a surface plant, like pumps and, and heat exchanges. And I just show here one for, a uh, plate and frame heat exchanger where it shows the cost as a function of the, the heat transfer area. So it pretty much scales with that. And just want to point out that um, this is a pretty, you know, this reference is almost 20 years old. And of course, there's a lot of inflation that has happened since then. And what I recommend you do then is when you use these older cost correlations that you use some kind of producer price index to bring it to today's dollars. And you know, luckily there is one for heat exchangers. So there's, you know, I just kind of took a screenshot of it so you can look at it uh, yourself. And so I just showed the, this particular example that this correlation was from January 20 to uh, January 2002. And you can kind of see, well, from January 2002 to today um, is, you know, about double, the price kind of doubled for, uh, this is the one for you know heat exchanger and steam condenser, so that's kind of like the, the most representative I find. So if you use these correlations, you all, you already have to double the cost in a sense to use them to you know for your project today. So I just want to you know give that information to you, so this could be useful you know when you are costing out you know your project. 
Um, you can also use some like typical you know, rule of thumb costs that are out there. There's several papers out there, some of them by Loon, that give some, um, some estimate cost in terms of what an application may look like. And so you can see if you are in that range you know, that are here. So you typically, this, this capital cost, uh, I would typically you know, you know, use is kind of the first column here, which depending on, on the kilowatt or megawatt size of your system, then you can just you know, multiply that with this value that gives you then the dollar amount. Um, for your for your application, and so um, they do some economic analysis here to to already come to some kind of levelized cost of heat where they made some assumptions here, uh, so that they may not be applicable to your project, like an eight eight percent interest rate, for example. And, but I, I think definitely this this first column here that could be like a, a guideline numbers for you know, the kind of cost that, that you're looking at. Then I want to go a little more into. So these are the things that I talked about, some of these aspects um, that come into play you know, with co-location. And, and, um, and th this actually shows here why it is important that you don't you know, transport over long distances your heat because you have to you know, take into account the cost end for these pipelines. This is an example here. I, um, I think it was in Iceland where they are transporting the heat, I think maybe from the National Valley plan, one of the nearby plans around Reykjavik into Reykjavik or so, um, they go sort of several kilometers there, but you know, that may be like a little bit of an upper limit there. It's, often we won't even go that far because you know, costs, you know, they, they can, you, know, you may quickly have to count a million dollars per kilometer. So especially when you have to bury them in uh, when they're underground, these pipes, and you have to account for heat losses, but you also have to, you may need permits, you have to, you know, right of way can be an issue. So there may be all kinds of you know, delays in your project and all things to keep in mind. Um, then this just shows in sense it's heat losses on the right here, where you have, when you start doing dozens and dozens of kilometers of lengths, you can see how, you know, your, your, your temperature at the inlet, how it just quickly drops um, by the time it reaches the outlet. And of course it's, it's a function of, um, you know, the floor that goes through there, but it, just to keep you in mind that, you know, try to avoid it. And if you do need some kind of long pipelines, you may have to account for the cost and for the heat losses, et cetera. So one thing to keep in mind there. Then another thing is um, that typically is very valuable for your project uh, is if you could do some kind of, you know, cascading that may be very beneficial. So in a sense, what you want to do is when you produce the heat to the surface, you want to just try to get as much heat out of it as possible before you re-inject it into the surface. And you know, one typical example is, is a coal generation plan. This is an example here um, in Iceland here, the blue light room where, <laughs> so they have a power plant, but then they still have, after you, you know, make electricity, and that sometimes is only 10 to 20% of the conversion efficiency that we're talking about, there's still a lot of heat in your geothermal fluid that you can use for other applications and in this example, they, is, you know, they have it for hot springs uh, or, or hot pools. They have it for actually balneology. They use it as well. Um, I think they even use, extract some minerals out of it. Um, so if the, the more you can do with your fluid in sense, the better your economics will be. And this is shows kind of like a generic, the generic idea of, of cascading where you, you start with high temperature fluid Maybe you make electricity with it. And if it's a little lower, maybe you don't make electricity, but you have some kind of application due to high temperature heat. But then typically after you leave that application, there's still some heat in there that you can use, for example, for greenhouses, uh, maybe even for face farming or so. So if you can do some kind of design that uses um, you know, as much heat as possible, it will you know, benefit your, uh, your, your bottom line. It, it will result into it's like a lower overall uh, levelized cost of heat. Um, other strategies there is hybridizing you know, your system. And this is actually you know, very you know, common, I would say, uh, that, that being looked at now and for, for district heating systems where, you know, this is an example shown on the left here and in the Paris basin and on the right, this is the one that's being implemented at, at the Cornell University campus. And you see both of these systems have you know, several additional components and, and the main one, for example, that, that you should consider in your project is that you may want to have a heat pump in there, like a, a, a large central heat pump, because 
it allows for boosting the temperature to your application. It provides some flexibility in your operation. Uh, let's say you, you have um, a, a production temperature in your resource that is just a few degrees too low for what your application needs, and you can have, consider a heat pump. These tend to be very efficient, they have very high coefficient of performance, so you just need to raise the temperature just by a few degrees, and then you can reach you know, your temperature that, that you need. The, the other way of, of looking at it is it provides some liability in your project. If, let's say you have some kind of decline in production temperature over time. It, it's less of an issue if you have a heat pump that can kind of you know, offset any decline that, that is occurring. So that's uh, something to, um, to keep in mind there. There are some other components. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, such as like a hot water storage tank that may be useful to kind of deal with some of those peaks that you have maybe on an early basis or so. Um, I'll have a slide on that later that you may have to consider uh, in your application. Um, and so this is a little bit of a simplified diagram. This is another diagram actually for the same system, which shows, you know, it, it can go into quite some detail. I'm not sure if you wanna go into that much detail for your project where you really are sizing it for, uh, for example, you have higher buildings that need higher temperatures, you have buildings that need lower temperatures, you, know, you have central heat pumps, but even at an auto location, you may have some other heat pumps. Um, you may have some integration with you know, heat from an existing plant, from an existing cogen plant. So it, it can get very detailed um, quickly. But um, I think the one thing you may want to keep in mind is after these, these kind of centralized heat pumps that can be useful you know, in your project. You know, the way it looked at, this is an example. You know, these are, we're talking then about you know, the multi-megawatt heat pump systems. And, there are cost correlations out there. You know, this would be the rule of thumb, $500 per kilowatt or so, or maybe even a little more. Uh, but they can definitely make them in multi-megawatt systems and, and they can be valuable, you know, in your, in your project. And coefficient of performance, they can be calculated as well, depending on the temperatures that you're dealing with, um, the, 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 like the required temperature and the supply temperature for geothermal fluids. You could calculate them yourself, and typically there are the data sheets from the manufacturer have the, the information to kind of see what kind of you know, coefficient of performance you have. Um, so I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. So this, in a sense, comes into play when we try to you know, hybridize a system with, let's say, like a hot water storage tank or a peak boiler. Um, if you have this kind of demand where you have a lot of heat demand in, in, in winter, but not a lot in summer, what you could try to consider is Maybe you can find another uh, demand for heat in the summer, such as using absorption chillers for cooling. Uh, or otherwise, you can try in the winter, uh, find a secondary heat source to provide this, this, this kind of large heat demand, because you don't want to just add geothermal wells to get to this 80 megawatt in this particular case, because most of the time they'll just sitting idle and then they'll have a very large capital cost, but they're just you know, using the geothermal system to its fullest extent, and that tends to you know, hurt your economics. So hot, that's where hot water tanks, for example, come into play, where you can kind of you know, always have some kind of you know, thermal energy stored there locally that if you still don't have a peak in heat demand, you can just provide it from, from that you know, storage instead of from your geothermal system. Um, and that's also where, let's say, an auxiliary boiler or so comes into play that tends to you know, help uh, your, your overall project economics if you can kind of like hybridize a system like that. And these are just some, some examples of how a hot water storage tank could look like. You know, maybe they, they typically you know, look like this, but this is kind of like a nice example in Reykjavik where there's a whole museum built around it. But this, in a sense, are these kind of hot water storage tanks that provides hot water for, you know, for the city. And there are you know, cost correlations out there you can look into that reference by Peters um, that I gave that you know, kind of just show you, um, or give you an indication of what the cost may be depending on the size you know, of your system, you know, of your tank. I just want to talk a little bit now about just one slide about an absorption chiller is that um, it is, that is being done where you can use your know, geothermal fluid for actually cooling, um, for a cooling application. It could be you know, residential cooling, or it could be data center cooling or so, um, you know, depending on, on your application. It, it may provide, you know, there could be applications where you just, that's the main application for your geothermal heat, just year-round cooling. But it could also be where in the summer, 
you use a geothermal heat for cooling. In the winter, you use a geothermal heat directly for heating. So these are different you know, approaches you could take and different configurations you could look at. But if we are considering an absorption chiller, I just provided you with some information here, uh, such as some cost numbers. You see down here, this, then, this is um, for, you know, for different sizes of systems. It shows typically it's expressed as like a dollar per ton. That's like your capital cost. And you just keep in mind a ton uh, I provided that conversion here is about 3.5 kilowatt of cooling. So if you have, let's say, a one megawatt cooling application, you need about 284 tons. So with, with cooling, they often express it in terms of ton. Um, and so anyway, so that's something to keep in mind when you cost your, your surface equipment. And then on the right, these are some typical coefficient of performance. And so that's for an absorption chiller defined as your cooling output over your heat output. So that's, you can use this. So it depends on your, your your type of absorption chiller depends on your geothermal fluid. But when you have that information, you can calculate if I have, let's say, five megawatt of heating, how much megawatt of cooling will that get me? So these are just some things to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, you know, and we're, we're approaching yet now, so we should have enough time then uh, for questions. I just want to talk a little bit about you know, economics. Uh, so when you are looking at your project, you know, you probably will typically start with you know, like you're getting to understand your subsurface, see your temperatures and, 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 and your megawatts and then try to get match that to replication design, you know, cost out your, um, or the first design, you know, select the components that are needed and then try to you know, estimate the cost of an entire system. And so you'll have to probably both do it for, you know, your subsurface as well as your, your, your surface. And, we talked a little bit about it in, in the presentation last time on, on geofires. And so um, that's a potential tool you could use. Uh, you can also just in, try to implement it yourself. You can use SAM to some extent. They have, there are cost relations in SAM as well, uh, which is in a sense like GATAM, but it's kind of converted into SAM. Now you can download it from the annual website. And so we typically, um, your drilling costs are a major component, so it's definitely something to look at. If you need to drill several kilometers deep and you may need multiple wells, so that will become uh, costly quickly. So there are cost correlations out there for that. You may even be able to use existing wells or convert abandoned wells or oil and gas wells or so. So then, of course, um, you, you wouldn't need the cost for an entire well field, but maybe there are some costs there for retrofitting or so um, that, that you have to keep in mind. Um, and then you know, I'll provide some cost relations for the surface equipment, things like heat exchangers, heat pumps, absorption chillers, you know, pipeline length. And so that's something um, to keep in mind. There's some information out there on o and costs that you may want to consider. Or often they would say like it's um, a few percent of your capital cost is your O&M cost. There are that's, um, some examples also shown here in this paper by Lund and what an O&M cost uh, could, could be. And then when you have all the information and you know the, the, the heat that's being provided, you could try looking into things like a net present value or a levelized cost of heat. Um, for those kind of metrics, you would have to assume some kind of discount rate. Uh, what would happen, you know, typically you'd apply some kind of you know, cash flow model. You have to discount, you know, future costs, future expenses to today's dollars. And, um, estimating discount rate for your project, it can be a little bit tricky. It's typically, um, let's say, high risk projects, you know, profit driven, they tend to have the higher discount rates, while uh, a more um, non for profit, you know, for the public goods kind of project, they have maybe lower the discount rates. For example, let's say a district heating system. Uh, in a city, sometimes could be built, you know, the city takes on a project like that and they have low cost municipal bonds, for example, to finance something like that, that may only be a few percent of discount rate while, let's say, a, a very competitive or, or, I mean, let's say, a, a, you know, just a, by a company that there's no government involvement and profit oriented, you know, dairy juice application at a chemical plant that may not be funded by that, but you know, that would, you know, would be equity funded that has high discount rate. So it's, there, there goes a lot into there. Um, so you may have to like, you know, carefully consider you know, what kind of discount rates, because it has a big impact on your overall NPV and levelized cost of heat. And, and some of the references I provided earlier, they give some examples of what you may pick there. Um, so that's something to look at. 
And then finally, when you have a lot of information, you could try to put it together in a tool and, and calculate a levelized cost of heat. You know, for example, with geophytes, that's what we did on that in that one study. And the idea is then we, when you have a levelized cost of heat, that kind of just captures in a sense, everything of your project, your subsurface performance, your cost of your project, your lifetime kind of all goes in there and gives like one single techno-economic metric that you can compare with other heating sources, um, you know, such as what, what would be the cost with natural gas boilers or something like when you provide heat from, from a natural gas furnace or so. So you can compare, um, you know, cost, you know, uh, cost like that. So, so that's, I guess, uh, how to, how it, how you could do a TEA uh, in your project. Um, then I just wanted to give you uh, finally some uh, takeaway messages in the sense of summarizing you know, what I've told you. These are some rules of thumbs that I think you'll have to if you try to take that into account in your projects. Uh, I guess, first of all, you know, when you, with your direct use application, you're definitely looking at co-location. And so you just have to see what's your local demand, what are your local applications. Uh, that, that, that you can use them. In general, you know, good design rule of thumb is try to maximize your utilization factor. It means when you have your wells drilled, you wanna just have them operating all the time in a sense, because that's how you get, uh, in a sense, most of your return on your investment. And so that means try to find a heat demands for the summer months, try to maybe consider absorption shares, try to consider multiple um, applications for your heat, you know, et cetera. So that's what comes into play there. Then you may have to hybridize your system. You know, definitely heat pumps are very popular there, or maybe some kind of auxiliary boil or storage tanks or so that, that probably will come into play in your system, especially for like larger district heating systems or so. That's something to, to take in mind. Um, then, you know, in, instead of, um, or besides just trying to use you know, your wells all the time. You also try to extract as much heat out of the geothermal fluid as possible. And, and making, try to make a clever design definitely can help with that. In a sense, the more delta T you get from production to injection temperature, the more heat you extract and the more you can lower your levelized cost of heat. And this comes into play with cascading, for example, um, or really try to, to match your production temperature to your surface application. Um, that, that can really result in, in to, to get, I guess, much heat out of it as possible. And then, and finally, you know, some of the projects that you are considering, like for example, the district heating sitting in a town may fall under that, um, could result from some kind of attractive financing and that actually will help also with your, your project bottom line, creation to that discount rate, um, and it, it will help lower your overall levelized cost of heat. So that's, you probably want, you know, want to take some time looking into that. And with this, um, I'm happy to take any questions now that, that you may have. I think we still have several minutes, I think about 10 minutes or so, eight minutes. So if there are any questions, um, put them in the chat box or otherwise I provide my email address there. Um, if you want to you know, send me an email. Um, and I, I do see there is indeed, um, Katie mentioned in the chat box, there is another webinar coming up on February 1st. And so that's by a colleague of mine at Enroll. If you want to learn more about you know, regulations and permitting, the link is provided there uh, to sign up. Okay, I see there's a question. This, would it be better to have peers of shutdown and lower the utilization factor to prolong? Um, well, you know, that is a little bit of a, of a trade-off. If you have, let's say, a system where after a few years, you start seeing already your reservoir simulations predict a significant drawdown, then yeah, probably yes. You just want to make sure you can at least provide the temperature your application needs over its design lifetime. And typically that would be 20 or 30 years. Typically, if let's say you do a simulation and after say 20 or, or let's say 25 years or so, you have any you have negligible drawdown, I think that would then typically mean you're kind of underutilizing your reservoir. You could try, you could extract more heat out, out of it. Um, so that tends to be 
um, you know, the, the, the way to do it. Um, so yeah, so I guess it's a little bit of a, yeah, I guess a little bit of trade-off. Try to, you know, make, also maybe consider a larger reservoir. You could try to do that. Um, typically, multiple wells you drill on site tend to become cheaper because you already know the subsurface, the second well pair you drill is cheaper than the first well pair typically. So you could try to make your system large enough that you can get all the heat you need and still try to get a high utilization factor. That's kind of like the ideal scenario you could try to get to. So, So there's a question about the uh, equipment sizing. Um, is it better to fully size the equipment? Uh, yeah, it tends to be, there's definitely, there's a lot of economies of scale happening with heat exchangers actually. Um, I just wanna point that out in this graph that I provided. This is, a, see, this is like a, a, a log lock scale here. Um, and if, if you can go to a larger heat exchanger, you know, it quickly goes up here from 100 to go to 1,000 square meters, but it doesn't get that more expensive. It doesn't suddenly become 10 times more expensive. So ideally, you can have, let's say, like one large heat exchanger that can just meet the, you know, the maximum demand that, that, that you need. Um, that tends to, you know, be... You know, most cost effective because of this kind of relation, these economies of scale you have with your heat exchanger. Um, I hope that addresses your question. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Good. And yeah, this is just the cost correlation that I shown here for a flat and for a plane and frame heat exchanger. Uh, remember in a large, this may be sufficient for if a very local application, let's say you have um, a green, uh, maybe not a green one, there you may have like a water to air one, but maybe in a chemical plant or so, you just have your geothermal fluid, you provide heat to some secondary fluid water and that's it, that's all you need then. But if you have examples where you need to transfer heat to air, uh, from, from the geothermal fluid to air or in a district heating system where you have multiple heat exchangers, you'll have to account for the cost for all of those and then you may have a large central one, but then you may have some smaller ones in the different buildings um, where then heat gets even transferred uh, from water to, to air. So there's a different correlations you may have to use. Um, but I, I definitely recommend taking a look at this reference. There's several correlations in there for heat exchangers. Wonderful. So, um, Thank you so much, Kunrad. Right. Um, you know, we probably do have time for one more question. If anyone has anything they'd like to put in the chat um, while we are waiting to see if any additional questions come in, I did just want to remind everyone we do have the module progress submission deadline coming up on February 17th. Um, that is a required progress submission. So if you are planning on submitting a final submission in April, you do need to get that February 17th one in as well. Mm. Um, we are also asking teams to think about including a contingency plan for their stakeholder engagement events in the event mm. that COVID prevents us from having in-person events through the summer as well. Um, mm. So please keep those in mind. Um, as Kunrad said, I did drop the link to our next webinar, which is on February 1st on environmental regulations and permitting. And then we will have one additional webinar um, on using the Geo Report Seat tool, um, which will be on February 10th. And we can, I'll, I'll drop that link in the chat as well. And Kunrad, it looks like we just got a question come in. Uh, okay, so let's see. A lot of oil producers are not increasing their flow. Um, what are your concerns if the shipping goes longer than the design can handle? <laughs> well, I, 
because I'm not a yeah, um, not because I'm really a drilling or a well expert to to drill, but I know shelling can be a problem. I guess it depends on your well design. If you have, let's say, open hole or so, that can be more of an issue. If you do a shut in there, you may have to start worrying about things like well bore collapse or so. If you have, let's say, it's nicely cased and uh, you have a slotted liner at the bottom, the shut in may not be, uh, may, may be less of an issue there. Um, but I guess yeah, ideally you want to avoid doing shut-ins of your well. It, it always may mess up something in your reservoir. Um, it may affect even permeability or so, or, or may do some kind of damage to the well. Um, but I guess it may depend a lot from well to well and how your well design is. Um, so I guess kind of like the best I can handle um, with that. Okay. Um, so I see there is, what is opportunity of ground source heat pumps. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there is, there's definitely a big market for, for ground source heat pumps. I mean, right now in the US, I actually saw a recent statistic, we have over a million ground source heat pumps installations, but it's just, it only provides, it was still like less than a percent of the heat demand uh, in, in, in the United States. In some countries, you know, Sweden or Switzerland or so, for example, there's there's much higher penetration of, of you know, geothermal or ground source heat pumps. I guess what uh, I think over time we may see more and more um, ground source heat pump systems that are being selected for heating homes because there's even some regulation already in some places where when you build new homes, natural gas is no longer allowed for heating your home, and so you would now that's like your next best option then if you just build a new home there's no district heating system or so then you could you should select a, a ground source heat pump system that you that would be powered by electricity and with this high coefficient of performance it actually lowers your overall um demand um for your for primary energy so i think there is definitely a big opportunity just one thing to, to keep in mind is that if you would let's say replace all the heating with ground source heat pumps, then we would have a big increase in electricity demand all of a sudden. And so I think there may be, you know, we may need some district heating, which could, for example, be from geothermal. We could use some ground source heat pumps and probably we'll be using natural gas, uh, I think for a long time, because that's true, like a lot of installations in US and Europe elsewhere are currently you know, natural gas driven. So that'll take a while before that all gets retrofitted. Um, but I definitely think that we'll see more and more of heat pump penetration for sure. Um, so yeah, so I think that, that answers all the questions. I think these other ones, uh, these are the, the links where you can sign up for the next webinars. To your report, yep. And the regulatory one, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckers. We really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Um, again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Beckers or you can email the general geothermal collegiate competition email address, which can be found on the Hero X site. Um, so yeah, have a wonderful okay. afternoon, everyone, and enjoy your weekend. Yeah, thank you all.